you very much. I should warn us all that in about seven minutes of voice she's going to tell us that it's one hour. So it's not my voice, it's some other... I actually tried to avoid speaking at this time so somebody else would have to deal with it, but uh, I'll deal with it. Anyway, um, I'm here to give a bit of a, the, the big overview, the big picture um, uh, about sort of the, the state of NGOs in the world today. I'm speaking to an NGO audience, so probably don't need to tell you about the phenomenal growth in the sector over the last dec decades, but indulge me, I will tell you about it. It's, it is worth repeating. So call them NGOs, non-profits, civil society organisation, social sector, third sector or private voluntary organisations. In the last two, three decades, the size, scope and salience of these organisations has increased phenomenally in almost every country in the world. And I say almost every country in the world. I haven't yet found a country where they haven't increased, but if you know one, please tell me. Um, this is a graph, and the visuals here aren't great, but you can see that this is a graph with a, a significant increase. This is the graph uh, that tells you the story here in the United States of the growth since, since the 1970s. We are now up to 1.5 million registered non-profit organisations, and every country will have some sort of graph sort of similar to that. Um, you know, the start date may be different, the, you know, the... Uh, the slope, the, the you know, degree of the slope may be different and these little bumps up and down of the historical moments may be different. You'll notice that there in about 2010 there was a dip down in the United States. We had a change here in the regulation, the registration of non-profit organisations and those organisations that hadn't submitted paperwork for three years were taken off the register. We lost about 200,000 non-profit organisations here in the United States from the registry. Now, the increase is both in domestic, sort of homegrown local organisations and in cross-border international non-profit organisations. International non-profit uh, uh, organisations in some countries will be international NGOs who come in and do development work, environmental work, but also here in the United States we have thousands of these so-called friends of or affiliate organisations that are, in fact, the local version of international organisations. So we have, you know, international sports associations, the, um, you know, the International Olympic Committee is also registered here in the United States. The Liceo, which is the Opera House in Barcelona, has the Friends of the Liceo registered here in the United States. And as uh, many of you probably know, there's a BRAC USA, Bangladesh Rural Assistance Corporation, also created its affiliate in the, in the USA back in 2000. And seven. So we have this phenomena in every country. So um, there's a, also an incredible increase in terms of the multilaterals association with non-profit organisations. So ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Council of the UN, is now up to 5,000 non-profits having uh, consultative status with the ECOSOC and the UN and all multilateral organisations have become much more robust in their processes of negotiation and uh, participation processes of NGOs. And then finally, corporations are also increasing their uh, collaborations with non-profit organisations. In the last plenary, what, we had somebody from McKinsey, from Grant Thornton, um, from Vodafone, uh, all these corporations are working much more closely with non-profit organisations and, in fact, they're becoming much more, let's call it, muscular in their own work with non-profit organisations that they are creating. Um, why exactly this is happening, I won't go into it. Feel free to come and take a class with me one time at Baruch College and you'll get a chance to examine it in depth. But I did want to show you one new term that you mightn't have been familiar with and part of the process. It's called philanthropication through privatisation. And this is the process why, by which primarily public goods move into the non-profit sector. For those of you familiar with New York, you'll know that, for example, Central Park is not run by the City of New York. 
Since the mid-1990s, it's been run by the Central Park Conservancy, a non-profit corporation that raises 85% of the funds that are used to turn the park into what it is today. And this is a kind of phenomena you're seeing around the world. And while philanthropication, I must admit I'm, I'm not crazy about that term, I would have called it philanthropization, but it's a, it wasn't my term, um, is not just about uh, public goods moving into the non-profit sector. You can also look at it as private goods moving into the non-profit sector. So we all know about the rise of non-profit media that's moving in to fill that gap as the business model of a lot of media is collapsing, non-profit sector is moving into that. Or even things like the New York Times every day now sends me a little ad in the online paper I'm reading asking me as a subscriber to also support the mission of the Times by contributing to their, their non-profit uh, uh, corporation. Um, then, uh, and all, in all sorts of... I'm doing some work at the moment looking at ski hills in Maine, right? So there's all these little ski resorts in Maine on the edge of town when they no longer become viable commercially instead of allowing the business owners to sell off the land or sell off those assets, a local non-profit corporation comes in, takes it over and turns what used to be a private business into essentially a public amenity. So that's happening uh, all around. Now, the growth in the sector, of course, is then reflected in universities and research centres about research about the non-profit sector and the way, the way it operates. And most of the research comes up with some sort of overview of the different models of how the non-profit sector operates in the world. And again, we have problems here with the visuals. You can't really see that. But this is my version of those models. So you can see that we have kind of little circles. So what I've done is I've divided the world based on if the country is what it's I It's 13 call, hours. 13. It's not one, it's 13. It's good to see that this is European and not American hours. Um, so it's 13 hours. Um, so the... Uh, and actually, let me just start up my clock here just to... Uh, anyway, I'll... Um, so, the, uh, so my version is if you look at if the country is civil society dominant and that's in terms of, you know, what is the regard towards civil society, um, how much of public services are offered to, to civil society or if it's much more government dominant. And then if you divide the world into more low-income countries and high-income countries, you get these sort of different circles about um, the different models of developing countries, of neoliberal countries, of corporatist countries, countries, social democratic, one-party countries. And in each of those environments, non-profits operate in a very different way. And for those of you who are working cross borders, you need to understand what the implications are of the operating environment of the NGOs that you're working with or the society you're working with. Have a look quickly at that graph and decide. I'll give you like 15 seconds to decide where the country you're from or where the country you do most work, where would you fit into that graph? I've put some countries there. Again, have a look, see if you recognise a country. And if you disagree with me, come and please talk to me uh, after or about where your country should be placed or where some countries that you're familiar should be placed on a figure like that. So we've got this phenomenal growth. We've got different models. But what's happening is... Uh, because, or despite or perhaps because of the phenomenal growth of the non-profit sector, there's been a backlash. There is what we now call the associational counter-revolution. So there's this official government backlash against uh, NGOs that work on democracy and human rights, NGOs that receive foreign funding. But in fact, any organisation, any non-profit that's considered disruptive to public policies is likely to find the weight of government in some countries coming down on them. Greater regulations, interventions, arrests of workers. In some places we get physical violence against workers, murders of NGO workers around the world by either by official state apparatus or de facto militias working on behalf of the apparatus. The International Centre for Non-Profit Law since 2012 has identified 120 
repressive legislative actions against non-profits around the world and Civicus's index uh, looks at uh, countries around the world and ranks them on how open or how closed they are to civil society. As you can see, only nine countries are rated as open to civil society around the world. On the other hand, we've got 32 that are classified as repressed and 16 that are closed. And that's about 110 countries that they were able to, to survey. So you've got this official government backlash against non-profit organisations. But you actually also have a social backlash against non-profit organisations. So last year, the Edelman Trust Barometer, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, for the first time had trust in non-profits on a global level below 50%. Right? It bounced back up this year, a little above 50%. Um, and yes, non-profits are still ahead of the media and government, but they're behind business. But, you know, 50% is no, certainly no halo of goodness about, you know, some sort of relying on NGOs as the moral arbiter around the world. So they're also battling trust in that sort of public opinion. But they also battle trust in terms of millennials and their attitudes towards it. So we heard in an earlier uh, talk about, you know, young people and how much faith we have in young people. And that's true. There is, you know, surveys showing the amount of solidarity among young people. But there is also a lot of millennial mocking of non-profit organisations. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the HBO series Insecure. If you haven't already seen it, I highly recommend it. The, the writer, actor, I think she's also the director, Issa Rae. The woman on the left is really one of the kind of superstars of, of media at the moment. But it's, an, it's a, um, a series, an HBO series set in a non-profit organisation and uh, a pretty inept non-profit organisation, I should say. It's actually called We Got Y'all. Um, works with minority inner city kids, a rather large organisation, and Issa, in fact, is the only woman of colour working in that organisation. Um, and she actually, in interviews, says that she chose that as the environment for her show because she wanted the characters to work in a nightmare environment. Right? And then there's others uh, out of Kenya. There was an attempt to create a, uh, a satirical show called, uh, uh, called The Samaritans about a fictional non-profit called Aid for Aid. Um, it never really got off the ground, but there's actually two very funny pilots up on, the, um, where, on their website. I, I, um, I, I encourage you to, to have a look at that. And for those of you who work with NGOs, you'll be familiar with all the satirical versions they have of NGOs. You know, do you work in an NGO or do you work in a bringo, a briefcase NGO? Or do you work in a flamingo, a flashy-minded NGO? Do you work in a mongo, my own NGO? Or do you work in a rongo? a retired officials NGO for former civil servants taking advantage of outsourcing which they themselves probably initiated. And I actually have a really long list of these. I think I'm up to about 30, 40 different versions of these. So we're dealing with this in the non-profit sector, this kind of backlash about people's opinions. And then down at another level, even things like crowdsourcing. You know, Crowdsourcing is wonderful. Peer-to-peer -peer, uh, participation through the internet without intermediaries, but it's also completely shifting our idea about what is a cause, quote-unquote, worthy of giving to, and then all the stories that come out about false crowdfunding and people who put up false sites is actually creating this whole level of cynicism about uh, non-profit non organisations and uh, their, their work. So this, this kind of lack of trust, this whole issue brings me to the, the last topic that I was asked to talk about. I've been asked to say some words on the VEX questions about whether small NGOs or large NGOs are more effective in their service delivery. My answer can be summed up uh, with three words, paradox of scale. Now, the paradox of scale is a concept quite kind of accepted in business and in entrepreneurship, that whole idea that you need to be big to have reach, resources, 
um, you know, influence, economies of scale in the organisation, but you need to be small to be flexible, innovative, local roots. Uh, but then, you know, there's these paradoxes. If you're big, you're often seen as, you know, bloated, slow to respond and untrustworthy and small is seen ha hampered by restricted capacity um, and often amateurish. I mean, Geoffrey Colon in the last section talked about the way you can actually deal with this paradox of scale. And, but it's something that we all have to deal with. But ultimately, neither big nor small is effective. It might be a tautology, but I'll say that uh, effective services are delivered by effective organisations, whether they're big or whether they're small. You just have to understand how to work with that paradox of scale. My colleague, Christina Balboa, who, who works with me at uh, Baruch College, talks about bridging capacity. And in some ways, it's similar to sort of all these collaborative discussions we've heard about now. The idea that whatever scale you are of an organisation, you have to understand the paradoxes you're dealing with and have to understand about partnerships, collaborations, about what it takes for you to deal with the restrictions your scale uh, imposes on you. Um, so I'll leave it there. Like any author, I won't leave the stage without putting up uh, the cover of my new book. Um, so if you're interested in reading about more of the work that I've been doing, um, have a look at my book, The Nonprofit World. Thank you very much.